Okay, can you see my slides? Yep. Perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, I just wanted to talk about how we're using Chaos Mesh to protect against a very specific um, distributed authorization problem called the new enemy problem, um, backed by Cockroach TV. Um, so like I said, I, I didn't realize that such, there was such a strong connection to TDB. So um, I am kind of curious uh, what the what the like related properties are for TDB. So maybe if there's time at the end, we can we can dig into that some. Um, but this is just going to be about how we're doing it with Cockroach right now. Um, so like I said, I'm Evan Cordell. I'm a, a software engineer at Offset. And Jimmy is also on the call if anyone has um, questions about Offset. Uh, previously worked at Red Hat on OpenShift uh, on the operator framework and at CoreOS on uh, Quay, Notary, and Tough. So I'm pretty familiar with the, the CNCF landscape and excited to be showing up to another CNCF project and um, hanging out. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we mentioned this already, but um, Ofsted does authorization as a service, um, and it's it's heavily inspired by Google's Zanzibar paper, um, and I have links to a bunch of this. I, I'm, I'm going to try and skim over some of the details, because I think we could probably talk about this for a long time. Um, and SpiceDB is our, our open source database that um, we, we back with Cockroach or Postgres or um, uh, memory right now. Oh, wrong way. Wrong way. Um, so what is SpiceDB? It's, um, we call it an authorization database, uh, which just means that it's, it's a database that is entirely tailored towards storing authorization based information and then querying authorization information from that. Um, the primary thing we work with in, in an authorization database in SpiceDB is relationships. So like um, relationships between entities in your system. So for example, uh, there's a file in a folder, there's a user that has access to a folder. Um, those are both relationships, right? The file's related to the folder by containment and the user's related to the folder by ownership. And then um, those are the things that we store in SpiceDB and permissions are the, th are the types of queries we make against SpiceDB. Um, and they're just computed over whatever relationships exist there. Um, so in that example, it would be, you know, a user has access to a file because the user has access to the folder that contains it, even though there's no explicit relationship stored anywhere that says the user has access to the folder, uh, to the file, I mean. And then we have a really strong focus on, you know, a simple API to query that. Um, from, from my high level description, it probably sounds a little bit like a graph database, but there's no, um, no complicated graph query language that you have to wrap your head around. There's very simple questions that you can ask of SpiceDB and get answers very quickly. Um, really strong emphasis on caching and um, distributing this, uh, you know, potentially globally. One of the interesting things with authorization is that it doesn't lend itself to being um, like semantically sharded. Like you can have, you know, silos of authorization data, but then it's really common to say, oh, well, if this user has this permission in this service, they should have access to this thing in this other service. Um, so, you know, that's why if you look at something like AWS, their, their IAM system doesn't really um, shard in that way. Um, so, it scales, but it's not um, siloed. And then um, I want to introduce the problem. And, and for that, I need to talk about a little bit about the schema. So I'm going to use this to say, like, this is how we write schemas for the database. Um, and then this is the exact schema I'm going to use to talk about the, the problem itself. So here, just like with SQL, you'd, you'd write a schema to, to find what data you can store. Here in SpiceDB, you write this type of schema to define what, what data you can store and what queries you can make. Um, so here I've defined two things, a user and a resource, and then two relationships. Um, so there's a direct relationship between a resource and a user, and the, this excluded relationship between a resource and a user. Um, so I, those are the things that I write into SpiceDB. I, um, you know, some, some resource A, has uh, a user has direct access to, or some resource B, a, a user is excluded from accessing. And then on the query side, uh, you query against a permission. And so you'd ask the question, you know, is a user allowed to access this resource? And we compute that over the relationships. We say anyone who is, has direct access can is allowed unless they've been excluded. Um, so this is this is kind of not an unusual schema if you have um, you have employees, but some of them are contractors. So Everyone gets added to employees, but then there's some stuff that contractors can't access, that, that sort of thing. And then this is where we're leading up to. This is the, the new enemy problem, which is a 
a name that Google gave to this, this problem in their uh, Zanzibar paper, which is essentially what happens if ACL rights get applied out of order to the backing store. Um, so as example, uh, if I have two rights here, I'm gonna write with using that same schema that I showed before. If I write that um, user me is excluded from accessing the goods, and then I write user me has direct access to the goods, then if I've done these two things in, in order, um, I wrote this and I wrote this, uh, and then I check again at a particular timestamp that I wrote the second one, then I should see um, that I'm not allowed, right? Because um, I've been excluded from accessing this. We always evaluate um, the, the checks that we do at a particular snapshot. Um, you don't have to specify, as a user, you don't have to give us a snapshot. We'll pick a good one for you. But if you do specify a snapshot um, that says, include everything that the database has up to this, this timestamp that we returned on the previous write. So that lets, um, the, the snapshotting part's important to avoid mixing and matching um, in-flight ACLs as, as we evaluate across the, the data store. Um, but then you can also use these timestamps to say, make sure that everything I know I've done is included in the checks that I'm issuing. So it gives you um, some pretty tight grain control over how you evaluate. Um, so the new enemy problem happens if the backing store can ever give me a, a timestamp T2 that's less than T1. And the reason this is a problem is because if I have T2 less than T1, um, then when I check at T2, I will see the T2 um, right here, but I won't be able to see the T1 right. So even though um, externally as a user, I wrote these in order, when I check against the database, I would see these um, reversed and I'd see, I would actually have access to a thing I shouldn't have access to. And one of the kind of interesting things about this problem is that, um, how should I say it? The timestamps kind of get poisoned, right? So, so this problem doesn't go away if I just wait a bit, right? Because once these timestamps are assigned in incorrect order, I'm evaluating at, a, at this snapshot. And so if, if it's ever possible for these to happen out of order, then I have this problem. Um, so I guess um, I can pause here if there are any questions. I, I know I covered a lot kind of quickly to try and get to the, the chaos mesh part, but um, if there's no questions, I'll keep going. All right, um, I'll keep going then. Uh, here we go, come on. Uh, so this, uh, we, we use CockroachDB. Um, I mentioned we also have a Postgres backend, um, and the backends are pluggable. So um, if there's interest from folks for TDB, that'd be interesting too. Um, the, the Cockroach um, backend has guarantees around external consistency like that for the, for those timestamp orders, um, but they only uh, the, the database only ensures that the timestamps are ordered if the keys that the transaction touch um, overlap. So if in in this previous example. If these have had been um, the same exact, I mean, they, we, they just don't overlap <laughs> in the uh, in the case for SpiceDB. These just write to different keys, um, and then we, we sit because we compute allowed over these two other resources. Um, so there's no way to, that these actually overlap internally. Um, so in theory, that means that because those keys weren't overlapping, we would expect that we'd be able to get those timestamps reversed from Cockroach um, according to their consistency documentation. Like this is the thing we expect. So ideally what we would do is have a test that shows that um, SpiceDB with Cockroach has this problem. Then we have a fix for it and then show that it doesn't uh, happen in practice once, once those fixes are in place. Um, and so for initial attempts, we just kind of flooded SpiceDB backed with CockroachDB with those exact calls, right, right, check over and over and over again, figuring if it's possible, you know, maybe eventually we'll hit it. Um, so that didn't end up working. Um, and the reason it didn't end up working has a lot to do with kind of cockroach internals. Um, but the, the relational data that you write to cockroach gets exploded into key values. And those key values get written into ranges, which is the cockroach name for like the small raft clusters that make up cockroach as a whole. And if you are writing two keys, even if they don't overlap um, relationally, excuse me, um, 
if they happen to land into the same raft cluster, um, they'll get assigned properly ordered timestamps anyway. So um, the CockroachDB ranges saved us, I guess, from the, the seeing this problem with our initial sort of naive testing. Um, so to get around that, you can configure Cockroach to make the ranges very small, and you can lower the replica count. Um, so I can I can remove the followers from the raft clusters for those ranges um, so that the writes don't hit more nodes, so that, that keeps timestamps from getting synchronized, because Cockroach, anytime um, requests go from one node to another in Cockroach, the timestamp um, caches get synchronized up a bit. And that prevents you from seeing that, that timestamp reversal. Um, but this was hard because even with that change, CockroachDB is um, heart beating. And especially if you're running multiple nodes on the same machine, it's heart beating fast enough to synchronize the timestamps between all of them. So all that said, um, this is finally where Chaos Mesh came in. Um, in theory, if we take one of the Cockroach nodes and we lie to it about what the current time is, we should be able to get it to assign older timestamps. Um, we still have all those other problems of ranges and the synchronization and timestamp caches that mean that even if the, if a node is slow, um, it will figure out that that's happened and um, and tell you and and bump up the the timestamp caches on the other nodes. Um, so we use Watchmaker from Chaos Mesh uh, to skew the time for one of the Cockroach GB nodes, and this finally did let us see the timestamp reversal problem. Um, so Watchmaker is really interesting. Uh, because it's the only project that I've seen and been able to find at least that can properly do VDSO swapping of the get time calls. Like there's a couple projects that can mock the syscalls for time, um, but none of them work for Go because Go uses um, VDSO for time calls. Um, so that that was incredibly useful once that once we saw that actually work. Um, all that said, though, because Cockroach is still doing all the heart beating and stuff like that, it was still kind of hard to see the problem consistently. It would sometimes um, take a long, a long time, uh, a couple hundred, couple thousand iterations before we actually saw a reverse timestamp. Um, and so for that, we also used uh, KSD to set a network delay between the slow node and the other Cockroach nodes. Um, that just gave us a little bit more time between when a bad timestamp was assigned uh, and that bad node heartbeated to the other nodes, which gave us um, much better chance of seeing the problem uh, in a test. So this is Chaos Mesh used as um, a CLI tool rather than as um, you know a running operator in a kube cluster. Um, I guess what I wanted to highlight is that in this case, the Kubernetes is kind of incidental to the problem. Like this is this isn't a thing that. Um, matters whether or not you're running in Kubernetes. So it was really valuable being able to have the non-Kubernetes um, non versions of Chaos Mesh to run, because we could encode it into a test in uh, GitHub Actions and run this entire test in like 20 seconds, right? Um, this is the typical time. And this isn't just a test to show the problem. This is a test to show the problem multiple times and then um, enable the mitigation against the problem which is just causing transaction keys to overlap so that it, it gets enforced. Um, and then another test to show that it, it's protected with those mitigations enabled. So I think that's, I think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to, to cover. I uh, hope I didn't go too long. Um, I have, I'll, I'll put a link to these slides and I have links to a lot of the stuff we talked about. Um, SpiceDB itself, outside if you want to play around with it. Um, is a blog post where I went into a lot more technical detail of this problem um, and then links to Zanzibar and, and Twitter if you're interested. So um, I think that's it. If you have any questions uh, or if you want to talk about uh, TDB in this scenario, I'm happy to talk about that too. So let's go. Oh, thanks. That was like so interesting. Um, any questions from the guests? I believe we have a lot. Oh, hello, Evan. Hey. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Um, you run your test not in Kubernetes. Maybe you can just use the 
daytime to to change the time is okay. Why don't you just use the daytime this uh, uh, Linux command? To change the oh, because I'm I'm running three um, three nodes on the same machine, so adjusting the machine time would adjust the time for all three nodes. Three oh, you you run uh, this test in three nodes. Yeah, there, there's three cockroach DB nodes running on the oh. same physical machine. Oh, a physical machine. Oh, uh, I, uh, I, I, my question is, why don't you just use the daytime this uh, uh, com, uh, Linux command? Uh, because you just uh, use the daytime, you can change change the time. Just uh, use this. Why? Uh, I think if you not run this in Kubernetes. Kubernetes, you can use this sound uh, Linux command. You can do this. You... Um, so I so SpicyB is written in Go, um, which uses uh, which which loads the um, get time calls with VDSO. And my understanding, or at least from testing, mm -hmm. I would say that nothing I did on the host affected oh. it. I I also tried um, faking the sys calls themselves. And I also tried um, uh, uh, Linux time namespaces, which um, just, you know, they're fairly new, um, but they just don't affect those clocks. They affect other clocks. So I didn't, didn't realize that at the time. Um, oh, okay, I got it. Um, hey, I, I also have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Another question, you, uh, if you use another um, chaos injection, chaos time, on your C C A or other test? Um, yeah, we're using the um, the network delay as well. Oh. We're using the the time delay and the network delay, but via the KSD stuff. Oh yeah, uh, you use the KSD? Yes. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, I don't have any any cost, uh, any, uh, any other questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I I now have another question. Uh, do you use uh do, do you have plan to use this uh chaos experiment in your uh ci pipeline or uh you only test it manually uh no it, it is enabled in our ci pipeline right now um so if i go oh. to space tv uh, uh, i just to uh, explore your repo i i and <laughs> I, 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 I do not find any test cases yeah it's it's here here i'll um i can show you the it's here in e um, so this is this is the test. It has a description of how it runs, um, and th this is the code for the test. And then yeah, it runs in a um, in a workflow here. Find it filter. I'll do in a test. Yep. So here's the here's a real run of it. Um, see it creates a cockroach. Um, oh. You then, use Watchmaker directly. Yes, we use Watchmaker directly. That, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like it, it's much, much, much faster. So um, we do run in production on Kubernetes. Um, uh, so we're we're, we're comfortable it. with Kubernetes, but for the CI tests, I mean the the full test run of this is eleven seconds, and that's just not. The, it takes longer than that to start like a a kind cluster in a in a CI test. Okay. Um, so. I got it. I got it. <laughs> Maybe we can focus this CCA on on TDB. <laughs> yeah, because we provide another uh, Git action uh, tools, but we uh, set up a whole chaos mesh on the Kubernetes cluster. So uh, it is kind of complex. So so so. Uh, 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 only use watchmaker is out of my managing uh, out of my imagination because uh, I, I think uh, no one 
<laughs> no, no one else could use our uh, command line tools. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, That's amazing. <laughs> yes, I developed the watchmaker only for debugging. I try to debug the time chaos and I develop the CLI tools <laughs> to find whether it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I saw. Um, I, I did. I did use uh, Chaos Mesh in in Cube Clusters for developing this um, test suite. But like I said, once once we kind of got it down, it's so much faster um, to run since we're we're not really relying on anything Cube related for this test. Um, yes. So really appreciate the work on Watchmaker. Like I said, I don't. I couldn't find anything else that uh, that did the VDSO uh, swapping properly. So. Oh. I call is this this feature the the author of this feature. He, he tries to use VDSO to hack the system uh, clock at time this system call. Oh, I, I it's a very cool feature. I think. Completely agree. Thanks. Yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, uh, uh, Evan, uh, I'm Chongwen. Hello. Mm -hmm. hey. I also have a question about CocrossDB. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and CocrossDB general the uh, time timestamp. Uh, uh, do you know uh, which nodes, which node to general this time timestamp? Do you know how to know this? Which nodes to general this time this time timestamp? Um, so each node keeps its own clock and will assign timestamps to the transactions that it's committing and managing the oh. commit for. Oh, e each node will generate this. Oh. Yeah, it, it'll be um, the, the, the node that has the raft leader for the range that contains the keys for the oh. transaction commit. Um, uh, I can't remember what they call it, the, the, the transaction identifier block. Oh, I, if this transaction uh, involves much nodes, uh, how to um, how to select uh, this uh, which timestamps or which nodes generate the timestamp? As a as a user, you don't get to control what nodes. Well, outside of stuff like the the geo rep features, um, you don't get to control what nodes generate the timestamps for the specific uh, thing. You can query after the fact. Um, I believe the there's a an, um, a cockroach query you can run that will tell you um, for any given uh, row what nodes are holding the the least leaders for those values um, and which ones are holding followers for those values. So you can kind of reverse engineer um, if you if you do a write and then you read the metadata about where the range is putting data, you can tell. You can figure out which node was giving you the, the timestamps, but it's not a thing that you could just get back um, from a query. Okay, got it. Uh, maybe it's different from uh, Spanner because Spanner use the uh, oh, when uh, use the when when node to generate the timestamp, and uh, uh, if uh, one transaction transaction will be must get this timestamp from this node and to get the timestamp. Yeah, and yeah. also this same uh, uh, TDB also use this this uh, this means. So um, so Spanner uses the the true time API to mm -hmm. get a range of of potential times. So yeah. each spanner each spanner node is still assigning the timestamp separately, mm -hmm. but they can all agree on what the cluster consensus time is because of the true time API. So it'll just it'll it does a thing called commit wait where it just it waits until um, the current real time or consensus time is slightly in the past, and then it that's when it advertises that it finished the commit. Um, so how does how does TDB, uh, TDB do it? Oh, okay, got it. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks. Do, um, do you know how how TDB like? Oh, since we have a little, if, unless unless we need to move on to another topic, I'm oh, curious uh, how we would do this. Uh, Oh, uh, TDB also, uh, TDB has a uh, components, we call this PD, and uh, the mm -hmm. PD uh, include a uh, ETC cluster, 
uh, and uh, we will, uh, so we, uh, PD will generate the timestamp and uh, we'll, uh, in, uh, we also catch the range of time, the range, uh, range of the timestamp and uh, uh, TDB when, when a transaction will be need to get the timestamp from the PD cluster and, uh, and, and also uh, maybe this, in this same to the spanner because, uh, and because in the PD cluster, you can send to the 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 timestamp API. Yeah. Okay, so th there's a separate cluster of nodes whose job it is to do timestamping in TDB. Mm. Yes, this component is both. Re uh, his responsibility is not only to generate the timestamp, but also to schedule the whole cluster. Yeah. Okay, interesting. But, yeah. but it's still a centralized timestamp generator. Yeah, is this a meta metadata service a server? And the, interesting. Uh, yeah, this PD components will be uh, uh schedule the 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 state or schedule the PD com uh, takeaway component because the takeaway is the story of the uh, the whole uh, whole database cluster. So it's, I mean, from, from that description, it sounds like uh, this problem wouldn't exist with TDB. Um, does, does, I guess, maybe I'll phrase that another way. Does, does TDB provide the, um, the external consistency or linearizability that, that Spanner does? Mm, oh, maybe, oh, uh, I, I don't sure that can maybe, oh, Maybe it's can uh, relate to the um, transaction. Um, uh, I, 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 sorry, I, I don't know how to describe this in English. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I, I was just curious. Um, we can definitely look into that. Let's see. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can search some document about TDB, and you can, uh, you also can try this. Uh, 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 it's very easy to install your. Uh, your cluster is uh, you can try it, and also you can find uh, some document about the transaction and uh, the timestamp. Uh, some some article about this. So we, you can find it on our on TDB or Pincap website. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely check that oh, out. So, uh, I think it's a great scenario for Cosmash to verify whether a database has implemented the external linearizability. Yeah, definitely. So maybe you can use the same way to observe whether TIDB has this support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it'll just, so like, I guess one of the things that was interesting about this test is that um, it didn't just require using Chaos Mesh, it also required, you know, yes. playing with the properties of Chaos, uh, of um, Cockroach to, to make the problem more evident. So I imagine we need to similarly understand TDB before we could write a test like this. Yes. Great. Well, um, uh, thanks for having me. If there's no more questions, um, I don't want to take up the, the whole time unless, unless we have nothing else. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Evan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Evan. Um, I saw Jimmy posted an issue in the chat box. I believe you guys have looked into TIDB before, uh, but I, I guess we can definitely work on that in the future. Um, if there's no more questions, I think we can move on to the technical updates. Hello, Zhi Tiang. Okay, let me share the screen. Yeah. Okay, my name is Zhitiang Zhou, and today I will share the technical updates for you. Uh, first part is new features and enhancement. Uh, for the controller, we have uh, enabled the leader election uh, for the controller manager, and we, pro uh, we now provide 
three replicas of chaos controller manager instance. So uh, chaos controller manager <laughs> finally have high availability guaranteeing. Uh, and we make an improvement on the chaos builder, uh, the code generation tools for chaos CRD structs, nor uh, now more detailed behaviors could be controlled by uh, more markers. Uh, and we build another CRD called physical machine chaos. So, uh, so that chaos mesh could integrate with chaos D for injecting chaos into physical machine and water machine. Uh, and we could also use schedule and uh, workflow to orchestrate uh, physical machine chaos with uh, other chaos together. Uh, and uh, uh, for the detail of uh, uh, type of chaos, uh, especially uh, uh, network chaos, network chaos uh, could uh, specify a certain network interface card for uh, for uh, chaos injection, and it's very uh, it's very useful with CNI, which uh, creates multiple network interfaces. And for chaos D, chaos D could perform time attack on certain process. Uh, so I think. Uh, just uh, last experience, uh, you, you, you could uh, use KSD instead of uh, use uh, watchmaker. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it, it, it could uh, it, it could be a try. And there are also some improvements on developing routines. Uh, we provide two Docker image, uh, build environment and dev environment. Uh, dev environments pack, uh, packs all the required external binaries, uh, for example, code generation tools, uh, they are uh, Proto C and the linters. Uh, so it makes more easier for uh, developing and, uh, and uh, debugging uh, on uh, different architecture and uh, different platform. And the only required tools is the Docker and it keeps uh, uh, your environment clean. Uh, the build environment image uh, provides base image for a uh, build chaos mesh, and uh, we also uh, provide uh, ARM sixty four images for uh, just to uh, uh, for uh, two images. With build environment and dev environment Docker images, uh, we could improve uh, developing experiments for most of our contributor, uh, both Linux and uh, Mac OS, both uh, AMD sixty four and ARM sixty four, and. Uh, we are going to migrate our uh, Docker images from doc.io to uh, ghcr.io, uh, in other words, GitHub uh, packages uh, for bypassing the annoying Docker registries uh, rate limit policies. At last, we add the Skywalking Eyes license checker for Chaos Mesh, GitHub repo, and uh, reformat the uh, bolt player for uh, each BIOS. Uh, it's a huge PR, yeah. And there are also many enhancements which are working in progress. Uh, for Chaos Dashboard, here are two improvements on the user experience on workflow. The first is, uh, the first is user could easily create HTTP, HTTP request based on the powerful workflow task node. Uh, the second is, uh, Chaos dashboard could show the related chaos experiment and events uh, with the uh, workflow node. Um, and the unified REST API is also in constructing. Uh, another thing is uh, integrating GCP OAuth on the dashboard. Uh, you could use your uh, Google account to log into GCP um, and log into the chaos mesh dashboard. And we are currently uh, currently working on uh, GVM Chaos uh, runtime injection. We are going to migrate from Chaos Blade to Bitman. Uh, and the last one, uh, yeah, the, the, the Bitman would bring more fluent pol uh, uh, bring more fluent policy file uh, for injecting Chaos into GVM. And we are reconstructing the uh, the Chaos control. A chaos CTL for the user friendly experience. At last, we are enriching the metrics of chaos mesh. It's uh, one of the uh, 
uh, an LFX, LFX mentorship project, and our mentee has uh, submitted their proposal uh, the, RF, the RFC, and the codes are in constructing. Uh, and uh, the next part is release, uh, and we have released two bug fix version, and the and the uh, and the latest version is two dot uh, two dot zero dot three. Uh, it's uh, it contains several bug fixes and enhancements, uh, and uh, some uh, useful <laughs> useful comments about uh, CR dash o configurations. The uh, next part is upcoming plan. Uh, for the next release, uh, version two dot one dot o dot o would be released at early November. Uh, you could see that, uh, so see that track issue and uh, some of uh, tasks has been finished and most of the rest uh, all, ha uh, all have their related PR uh, waiting, for re uh, waiting for review. And I think there would be uh, uh, another uh, at least one bug fix version before we release uh, 2.1.0. Okay, uh, if you want to try the chaos mesh, including all the latest feature in 2.1.0, uh, please uh, follow in the document in the chaos mesh dog, and it will guide you have a quick, uh, quick, quick start on the journey of the chaos. Okay, that's all about the technical updates. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay. Hi, Mila, uh, could you share the community update? Uh, of course. Uh, hold on, let me share my screen. Uh, so uh, I'll give you a quick round of, of what the community has been up to in the past month. Uh, so I know it's the end of October, but uh, if you haven't already, you can still join in on the Hacktoberfest, which Chaos Mesh is a part of. So basically you need to have four PRs uh, merged uh, that in the repos that have the topic Hacktoberfest, and you'll be eligible to receive a custom-made Hacktoberfest t-shirt. And another good read is obviously from our guest of honor, Evan, wrote all about solving the um, uh, test suite that he built to, to ensure SpiceDB's usage of cockroach. And some collaborations and integra integrations we have been working with uh, is obviously the first one, uh, Chaos Mesh. We made it available on the Coopsphere App Store. Uh, thanks to Chen Wen and Feynman's uh, hard work earlier this week. Mm, we're still working on some documentations and a blog post to explain how it all works. But right now, Chaos Mesh is accessible from the Coopsphere 3.2 RC version. So make sure to check it out. And um, and uh, obviously, Zhu Tiang talked about the Skywalking collaboration earlier as well. So um, yeah, that's that. Uh, and obviously, if you are a Chaos Mesh adopter or would like to share your Chaos Mesh story, feel free to raise a PR against the Chaos Mesh adopters.md file. And uh, when you do, or if you are simply a contributor of Chaos Mesh, make sure to fill out some form to claim your swag. Uh, we will leave the slides link in the meeting minutes. So make sure to check the slides out and fill out the form. And uh, we also want to give all of our new contributors a quick shout out. Uh, thanks to all of your contributions in the past month and the past years. 
um, Cal Smash would not be here without you. So thank you. Yay. And um, I believe that's all we have. And do we have any more questions? Anyone? If not, I think I'll quickly just wrap this up. So, um, hold on. Thank you, Jimmy and Evan, for agreeing to come to this meeting. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Uh, uh, would love to work out, uh, not work out, but would love to work with you in the future as well. And um, it was a lovely uh, sharing. Thanks. And thanks for everyone to for joining us today. Have a good rest of the evening or rest of the day. And good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.